You know, there's not a question if our God reigns. The question is, are you letting God reign? And that's what you really need to struggle with and answer today. If you have your Bible with you, Bible out with you, get it out, open it up, whatever you're doing there. And I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to pick up where we left off two weeks ago. And while you're, while you're turning, I just want to again just praise God for last week and the students that led our worship. Can we just get a, a, a praise for that? I think every one of those guys and gals did an awesome job letting the Lord use them in a, in a beautiful way. We're going to, to pick up where we left off with God's renovation plans. And today we're going to kind of start... Uh, not actually at the first step, but we're going to kind of say it and then back up a little bit because what we're going to talk about today is Demolition Day. And so Demolition Day is the day that all the old things have got to go to get ready for the new. And so what I've already just been praying and asking the Holy Spirit to do is help each of us to hear his voice this morning and allow him to reveal during these next 30 minutes or so what are the things that need to be demoed spiritually in our lives. What are, where are the old things that need to, to be thrown out and hauled off? So I'm just going to ask and continue asking that the Holy Spirit allow you to hear and me to hear what needs to be demolitioned in our life today to get ready for his renewal, renewal process. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I want to read verses 16 through 18, and I'm going to concentrate on verse 16 and barely really one word in verse 16 because it must be very important because Paul used it about a half a dozen times in the rest of his writing throughout the New Testament. So let me pick up in verse 16 of, of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Therefore we do not lose heart. And man, this is such a true verse. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles or afflictions are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Now picture an old-fashioned balance scale right there. And you take everything that you've experienced as trial, tribulation, trouble, affliction, all of that stuff, and you just mentally right now pile it up on one side of that scale. And that side of the scale is going to smash down, right? Boom. And then on the other side of the scale, Jesus Christ showed up. Jesus Christ lived perfectly. Jesus Christ died our guilty death. Jesus Christ rose from that tomb. And Jesus Christ said, where I go, I go to prepare a place for you. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you to be in that place with me for eternity. And what Christ has just done is he just took all the glory that's coming from eternity in heaven and put on the other side of your scale. And that thing just said, boom, back on the other side. What is to come far outweighs everything, add it up, press down, put together, multiply. What is to come in eternity far outweighs anything that we'll go through in our lifetimes here on this earth. Now, I don't know about you, but that gives me something worth looking forward to. I know the best is yet to come. There's been some good days in my life and there's been some valleys and some bad days in my life, but all through it all, the best is yet to come. What in the world would happen if the church really got a hold of that and that wasn't just a cliche? What if we really lived life every day as though the best was yet to come? Man, we'd be changing the world, wouldn't we? In the name of Jesus Christ. So, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory. And that eternal glory far outweighs all that we've been through, all that we will go through. So we fix our eyes on not what is seen, that stuff that's on that other side of the balance scale, but, what on, but on what is unseen, the eternal glory. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Folks, it changes everything. It changes everything, but there's one verb in that sentence, in that passage, renewed. Though our outward bodies are wasting away, decaying, diseased, dying, sin is taking its hold on that, and you can see it. All of us can do that. But inwardly, we are being renewed. That's the word, renewed. 
Now, what in the world does Paul mean by renewed? Let's just let the other scriptures that he used that same word in talk to us just a minute. Listen to this. And I'm going to go quick. And if you want these scriptures later, I'll give them to you. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Colossians 3, verse 10. Having put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge and the image of our creator. Titus 3, verse 5. He saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.23, to be made new in the attitudes of your minds. So there must be something very important about this renewal process or this renovation process if Paul used this word over and over and over again in his writing. It's like I used to work, use the word minutia a lot in preaching. It means the little bitty things, the little detailed things. Don't get caught up minutia in the little things. I don't use that word hardly anymore. Because the smart aleck in our congregation started telling me I use that word all the time. And I'm just playing. He knows exactly what I'm talking about. So he's over there smiling too. But it's those little things. We need to renew it. It needs to get down to that level of detail in our life where we got to get everything out of the inside that's not of God. I'm going to say a couple of names here that everybody in this room is probably going to know. And if you don't know these names, you're just probably, you're probably not with it. You're probably not like cool and, uh, you know, happening, any of those kind of things. Chip and Joanna Gaines, right? They, they are the re renovation experts, the Magnolia Home brand. They got their own television network now. But Chip and Joanna Gaines are known as like just home renovation and commercial property renovation experts. They know the ins and the out. But I got something to say that's a little bit negative to Chip and Joanna Jones. Their television show and their stuff has probably ruined more marriages than anything else in the United States of America. And I'll tell you why. Because now every woman in every home in the United States of America thinks that a whole house can be renovated in about 45 minutes of airtime. <laughs> that, that, that's what's been the problem with Chip and Joanna Gaines, see? <laughs> but Chip and Joanna Gaines have developed a process that takes the ugly and makes it beautiful. They know how to renovate. He has a construction background. She has a design background. And when you bring the carpenter together with the interior designer, you make beautiful results. This is what Chip and Joanna Gaines have done for years and years and years and years now. They're simply renovation experts. The problem is, is we don't see what all goes on behind the scenes. That's the problem with what we see on TV. It doesn't matter if it's the couple from Laurel. It doesn't matter if it's the couple from Waco, Texas. It doesn't matter if they're flipping Las Vegas or flipping New Orleans or flipping on Church Street. It doesn't matter. The process for renovation is still the same. And if you're watching it on TV and not doing it in your own home, you don't know what all is going on. That's right. But here's the deal. People do not question the Gaines' ability to renovate, even when people don't, don't understand the renovation process. But evidently, billions of people question God's ability to renovate. But God accomplishes even better results. What God has done behind the scenes through his son, Jesus Christ, is far greater than any property that's ugly being made beautiful again. Any property that's non-marketable being made marketable again. That's what Chip and Joanna do, and they do it well. And man, I could get a phone call today, and Mitch and I's house is just over a year old, and Chip and Joanna, Chip could call me, and he said, Brother Brian, man, we heard you on YouTube, and the Lord moved upon our hearts. We just want to, we want to come bless you and Miss Mitzi, and we're going to have a whole crew show up at 700 East Avenue, and we're just going to redesign the whole inside of y'all's house. And I wouldn't say, well, Chip, it's not but a year old. I'd say, come on down. I'd say, do it to it. Because what you're going to do is it's going to make it better than it was. 
But what I'm trying to get a point is do we have more trust in the Chip and Joanna Gaineses in this world to renovate our property than we do in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit to renovate our souls? That's the question I'm trying to get to and what I want us to answer today. Because yes, they are renovation experts, but they are not as expert in renovation as our Father is. He is the master renovator. And you need to see him like that. Because see, here's the, well, I'll talk about the big difference in just a little bit. Chip and Joe can renovate my home anytime, but I, and I trust them, even though I never met them, but God is renovating my heart, and I trust him more. So today is about getting rid of the old and making way for the new, and I just want to give you three points real quick. And I just want you to think through this, and I'm going to ask you one question at the end. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? That's it. Bottom line, plain and simple, cutting through all the red tape. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? So just listen. Listen for his voice. Ask him the question and he's going to give you the answer. Point number one in demolition day of God's renovation plan. You have got to sit down and you've got to take time to identify what is going to be demoed. Are removed. You got to take the time to do that. Because, folks, this is going to be a total renovation. God doesn't do partial renovations, God does complete gut jobs. And what a gut job is in the renovation is you got to get it down to the bare stud walls. You got, if you got buckling floors, you got to know why the floors are buckling. You got a, if you got a bad kitchen and you've had a plumbing leak in there and it's got mold behind the cabinets and you've got things that's got to be done or it's outdated and old, all of that stuff's got to go. And then how far down do you have to go? I'm telling you, when God does it, God does it totally. And the reason I know that God does it totally is the verse in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... The new creation has come. The old is gone and the new is here. Total renovation. Complete gut job. Getting it. Have you ever allowed God to just strip you down to the bare bones of who you are spiritually? There was another renovation show a mother and a daughter did and it was called Good Bones. Right? We've got good bones. The structure that we have in Jesus Christ is awesome. It's amazing. It's the stuff we choose to hang on these bones that mess it up. If there's a problem, the problem's never with God. Can we agree on that? (laughs) Well, we want to blame God in a lot of things. Because we've gotten trained in this world and the culture that we've grown up in. Let's don't take responsibility. Let's blame others for it. Right? Right? It happens in politics, but it also happens in churches. It happens in schools, and it happens in homes. I was glad to have an older brother, not really because I like him, but I had somebody to blame my stuff on. I love him, and I love to blame him on him. But at one point, I had to grow up and understand, if I was going to be who God called me to be, I had to learn to take responsibility for my own actions. Complete gut job, allowing God to get us down to the bare stud walls of our spiritual existence. You've got to identify what is going to be demoed. And that's what I want you to ask the Holy Spirit. Lord, what's in my life that's got to go? What's in my life, Jesus, that needs to be demolished? cast down, carried out, and hauled off. What is it? Then take just a moment of silence and bow your head and close your eyes and say, Lord, Holy Spirit, what is it that is in my life right now that needs to be demoted? And you probably don't have to write that down. You're hearing it loud and clear right now. You may not want to hear it, but you're hearing it. Now, it's up to you what you do with it. You can keep something that's old and worn out and moldy. You can keep something that's making you sick. Guys, in in the chaplaincy, the hospice chaplaincy that I do, it amazes me at how many people are sitting with oxygen up their nose and a cigarette in their mouth. (laughs) 
And I'm like, do y'all know that could explode at any point? I mean, come on. You know, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I'm not the dullest either. <laughs> and if there's a sign on that tank that says explosive, why in the world we got anything dealing with fire around this thing? And I'm in here going to pray for you, and I'm going to pray that we don't blow up together. I'm going to pray the Lord let me out of here, and you blow yourself up if you're going to blow up anything. But what's the Holy Spirit telling you needs to go? Number two, after you identify what is going to be demoed, you can't just go into that project or that property and just start ripping stuff out. Because a lot of people want to do that. They just want to go in and start tearing stuff out. When we were renovating the, the cafe over here, we had um, some different people doing some different things. We probably didn't have just an all together plan, but we just started ripping stuff out. And I learned a big lesson because we ended up ripping out things that we thought were duct work that didn't have any use anymore. And what we didn't realize that it was the ventilation system that goes to the, to the, to the system that sucks all of the smoke and stuff out of the kitchen when you're cooking. And we just ripped all that stuff out and just threw it away. And then guess what we had to do? Exactly. Because we came in, we didn't have a good plan going in, and we said, hey, man, we just got to get this done. Let's get it done as cheap as we can. And we just got together and started ripping stuff out. And do you realize that it cost more in the end because we didn't have a good plan in the beginning? Don't just start ripping stuff out. Count the cost. And listen to Luke 14, 28 through 30. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Count the cost. Don't just go in there and start ripping things out. Let me tell you what I've learned the hard way. First step, consult a professional. Consult a professional. If you need a hamburger cooked, I'm your man. I can cook you a hamburger. If you need to hear about Jesus, I'm your man. I can tell you about Jesus. If you need somebody to pray for you, holler at your boy. I can say a good prayer for you. But if you need somebody to renovate your house, don't call me. Number one, because I'm worn out in renovation. And number two, you need to consult a professional. You need to sit down with somebody that knows the different layers of the renovation project because you've got to start in the right place if you want to end up with the right results and not be wasting money and time and everything else going back and forward. First step, consult the professional. That's why I had you in step one, go to the Holy Spirit and say, hey, what needs to be removed? We have consulted the professional this morning. The greatest renovation expert that the universe has ever identified and seen is the Holy Spirit of Almighty God. We have consulted and need to continue to consult the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you something right now. If you are building in the city limits of Columbia, Mississippi, don't just think you can do whatever you want to do on your property. Because you cannot. There are committees that need to commit there are boards that need to be heard from. There are permits that need to be procured. There's a process that must be followed. And if you don't follow that process, your job will get shut down. And it will cost time, and it will cost money, and you will get aggravated, and you will get upset. That's why you need to just go through the proper channels. I don't really know how it works in the county, but I can tell you right now, honey, I do know now how it works in the city. You can't cut a tree down in the city without having a permit. And you say, well, that's just not, I don't know why in the world they do that. It's just the way it is. There are local ordinances in the city of Columbia, and the ordinance is there for people's safety and property preservation and all the different things. And me and Mitzi didn't really know that our land was right smack dab in the middle of the historical district. So we had to do all the historical stuff, right? So all of these different things, and it's just a process. But I'm trying to tell you that because it's a process. 
Being a disciple of Jesus Christ simply means I am a lifelong follower and learner of Jesus. Discipleship will not happen in a six-week program. Discipleship happens over a lifetime. From the time we surrender our lives to Christ to the time we meet him face to face. Paul said, I have not arrived. But one day when I see him, I shall be as he is. So we just need to get comfortable with this growth and this renovation process. Consult the professional, procure the permits, because if you don't do these things, you're going to be stopping and starting and doing and redoing all the way through the project, and you're going to stay frustrated. And one of the major problems in the church today is we got people that claim to be followers of Christ that are simply frustrated. Because it's getting in and feeling so good with God today and then a month down the road it feels like the rug gets pulled out from under you and now you're frustrated with God. Whoever the preacher was that told you everything was going to be beautiful the day you surrendered your life to Christ, they lied to you. They lied to you. If they told you you could walk an aisle, pray a prayer, be baptized, and man, there's nothing going to be wrong in your life ever again, God helped that man or woman because they lied to you. Now, I can promise you that if you have come to Christ and surrendered your life to you, everything in eternity is going to be awesome. But the process of going through the trials to get there is going to be tough. The call to be a Christian is going to be the hardest, most difficult calling that's ever been placed on your life. You say, well, preacher, that's not going to be good for church growth. I'm not worried about church growth. I'm worried about your growth, and I'm worried about my growth. I would rather be small in number but deep in soul with people that know how to follow God and people that live the life of following God. And we're not getting riddled with scandals from church members and even off of the platform because of what, how people are living and choosing to live their life by saying, I'm a Christian, and then not living like one. There's the growth that I'm after. And I'm after it in my life because I'm submitting myself daily to God's renovation process. Consult professional. Procure the permits. Count the cost. And let me tell you one more thing. When you get through adding up all the costs, go ahead and find out what 30% of that figure is and add it to the bottom line. Because any professional would tell you to figure a minimum of a 30% overrun. But boy, here's the good news for us this morning. Jesus paid it all. Man, you know what would have been so cool that if a year ago when I was building the house over there at 700 East Avenue, if somebody would have come up to me and said, hey, Brother Brian, we opened you up an account over there at MCS Building Materials. Y'all just go ahead and get whatever you need. And then when y'all get through, just sign on the bottom line and, 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 and all of those materials are going to, I'm going to take care of that. It's all paid in full. Man, I'd have built three times bigger of a house. <laughs> right? <laughs> because it wasn't my budget. I wouldn't have. That would have been abusing that trust. I'd have built what we planned to build. But the bottom line is, it would have been so nice for somebody to say that. It looked like somebody in Mitzi's family would have stepped up <laughs> and took care of some of that stuff. So if they are listening right now, I'm just really, she's really disappointed in y'all. <laughs> but man, wouldn't it have been so great to know that the debt was paid? That's what Jesus has done for us. Amen. From birth to the time we come face to face with him, he said, I have taken care of it. Your debt has been canceled. Hallelujah. Jesus paid it all. Amen. And then the old hymn goes, all to him I owe. Man, if one of her family members would have just done what God put on their heart, I know they were just <laughs> disobedient. You know, I would have never looked at that person the same again. I was like, man, that's the family right there that, that paid my debt. You know what? I, I will always owe them the, the gift of gratitude. And every time I saw that person, I'd say, man, I just, I can't, I don't even know how to thank you for paying that debt for me. But yet we come into church and get in our seats and twiddle our thumbs through the worship service and through the opening of God's word. When he's paid it all, not just a bill at the 
local hardwood, uh, local uh, hardware store, lumber yard. But I'm talking about paid it all. I'm talking about shed his blood. I'm talking about paid it all. I'm talking about washed every sin away. Jesus paid it all. And just because somebody paid a, a lumber yard bill for me, I'm going to be forever grateful to them. Jesus paid it all. Yeah. Folks, every day we get up, we ought to be saying, thank you, Jesus. You paid it all. Yes. Thank you, Lord. You paid it all. Every night we go to bed, thank you, Lord. You paid it all. Every time we come into church, oh, Jesus, you paid it all. All to you, I owe. You know what that means? I don't care what nobody in here thinks. He paid it all. The bill is gone. That's why we praise and that's why we worship. Other folks judge other people. You know what Jesus said? You don't know the cost of her oil. You don't know the journey that lady's been on. You don't know why she's washing my feet with her tears and drying them with her hair. You don't know the cost of her oil. Amen. That lady knew that Jesus had paid it all. Amen. And she knew that all to him she owed. What about that woman with an issue of blood for 12 years that, that made her way through the crowds and just touched the hem of the garment of God? Yes. Do you think that lady's attitude of gratitude changed when all the life that was leaving her through her blood issue was now fixed and healed in the name of Jesus Christ? I bet her worship changed. I bet they wanted to throw her out of the synagogue because she wouldn't sit still and listen to the scrolls being read. I bet they said, oh, I don't know what's wrong with you, but said, I don't know why you acting the way you acting. Well, honey, you wasn't there when I touched the hem of the golden garment of God and he cured everything in my life. And the reason I'm acting the way I'm acting is because I love him so much and I just can't quit telling him thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. What, what, what you think Lazarus' worship changed? When after being dead for four days, he came out of that grave at the voice of God? You think the paralyzed man that his four friends let him down through the roof? You think his worship changed? You think his daily devotional habits changed? Hmm. That's the renovation process. But you don't just go start ripping stuff out. Don't be even be impulsive this morning. And say, oh, I gotta quit this, 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 this. And you leave here with a list of 30 things you're gonna quit. No, you're not. All you're going to do if you leave with a laundry list of the things you need to quit is you're giving the devil ammunition to manipulate you with. Let the Holy Spirit reveal to you where to start, allowing him to rip the things out that need to be demoed. Let him make that determination, that decision. And you be obedient to him. And you start worshiping him like you owe him all because he paid it all. Count the cost. And number three, this is huge, y'all. And I, this is another lesson I learned through the renovation process. Decide what to do with the trash. Now, that don't seem to be a big deal right there. But you need to determine what you're going to do with all the trash that's demoed. All the old cabinets that are torn out, all the old sheetrock that's got to come out, all the insulation that's got to come out, all the flooring that's got to come up, the old bathtubs, the old commodes, the old fixtures, all of the stuff off the ceiling, all of the stuff that's going to be demoed and come out. you got to decide and have a plan with what you're going to do with that. And I can just go ahead and tell you from experience, even though they are expensive, go ahead and get a dumpster. Go ahead and get some company to come in and bring the biggest dumpster they have and go ahead and find that roll-off company that's going to haul that trash off on a regular basis. Because me and Mitzi was going to try to save money and have a burn pile. Because everything we had done yet had been in the county. So we was just going to burn on a weekly basis like we did when we built our other house. But the problem is you can't burn in the city limits of Columbia. <laughs> and do you know they will send a fire truck to your house to tell you that? <laughs> and do you know that they will threaten to write you a citation if they catch you doing it again? So what I would do is send Mitzi out after dark so they couldn't see the smoke rising. <laughs> Just playing. I told you that was wrong. Go ahead and get a dumpster. Why? Because it's cheaper in the long run. 
Because I can't tell you how many 16 foot trailer loads of trash we haul to the dump. And now at the dump it costs you a minimum of $25 to dump it. And I was like, oh my goodness. This $400 for a roll off don't sound bad at all. Go ahead and get a dumpster. What are you going to do with the trash this demo? Hey, let me read you a couple of verses. Psalm 103, verses 11 and 12. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he's removed our sin from us. Did you know Jesus Christ is the greatest roll-off, haul-off service that we could ever have? Man, think about that. We thought it was Ridge around here. The yellow containers with the blue writing, that's the one we used. I'm sure there are other companies that are just as good. But ain't none of them as good as Jesus. Because he's going to take all that stuff we leave at the altar and leave on this floor today in this church. And he's going to take it and he's going to remove it as far as the east is from the west. And then, and then Colossians chapter 13, uh, excuse me, um, verse 13 and 14. When you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Amen. Folks, you talk about the haul-off specialist. It's Jesus Christ. We don't have to walk and work with all of this trash. I hate to admit this. I made two huge mistakes in the building of our last piece of property. Number one, I put the burn pile too close to a really pretty oak tree. I thought I had it far enough away, but the fire was so hot that it killed one of the trees in our yard. And then we had to have somebody come, come in and cut down one of the trees in our yard. And the tree didn't ever catch on fire. The fire never hit the tree. It was just the heat from the pile that got up into the leaves and then it started dying from the outside in because of the heat that it was subjected to. And then number two, I said, well, don't worry about that. Let's just put a pile right here in the backyard. We'll take care of it one day. It's still one day. One day still waiting. I'm mowing around that pile. I'm weeding around that pile. And I keep saying, I need to haul that pile off. And I'm mowing around that pile. And I'm weeding around that pile. And let me tell you another thing. Don't go just rent a bunch of storage rooms. Don't create ways to keep your junk. And you know what Christians have become really good at? Creating ways and spaces to store the stuff that we really don't need. I'm pausing for effect right there. Because I need you this morning when you continue to ask the Holy Spirit what needs to be demoed. You're probably going to have some storage units that need to be cleaned out. You're probably going to have some piles in the yard that need to be hauled off. You're probably going to need some attic space cleared and organized. And folks, you don't realize how much junk you got until you start to try to renovate or move. I've never heard anybody that was moving from property to property say, oh, I just didn't realize how much I didn't have. <laughs> it's always the common thing. I did not know how much stuff we had accumulated in this amount of years. That's why folks hate moving. Because it ain't the part that you just got a couple of bedrooms and some furniture and some stuff to move. It's when you pull that ladder down from the attic or the outshed or whatever the case may be. All that stuff you got to get cleaned out. Yeah. Folks, that's the stuff that I'm asking us to talk to the Holy Spirit about today. Clean out all the junk. Let him get it down to the bare studs <laughs> and the bare choices and let him do a complete gut job on your life spiritually. That's what I mean by demolition day with God. Now here's the big difference between Chip and Joanna Gaines and God's renovation process. If Chip and Joanna were to come down 
and give Mitzi and I a free renovation on our property. The day that they left and took their crew and the cameras and all, went back to Waco, Texas, our place would be absolutely stunningly beautiful. It would be ready for a magazine, beautiful. Everything would be pristine. She even comes in and, and stages it, which means sets up the plates and, 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 and all the stuff on the bathroom cabinets, and it's just beautiful. Amazing, right? But the problem is that once they pull away from the property, they're not going to come back and check on it next year or tomorrow or next month. They forever got it archived on a TV show. Here's what it was. Here's what it is when we left it. I wish they'd come back about 10 years after the original show aired and show what happens as people live in it, as children grow up in it, as time takes its toll on it. Because see, you don't just get renovated once. The renovation process has to lie, last a lifetime if you want it to stay in pristine condition. Why? Why do we take our cars to get serviced every three to 5,000 miles? Because we want them to stay in good working order and we want to try to prevent major breakdowns by doing maintenance before those things happen. But we don't do the same thing for our souls. Why, if we have a water leak in our home, do we get a plumber over there as quick as we can? We run out to the water meter. We shut the water meter off. We're going to be without water for as long as it takes for a plumber to show up here and get the water leak fixed. Because if we turn the water back on, this could potentially have all kind of ramifications for our home and the maintenance of our home. Why don't we do that with our souls? Could it be we got more trust in plumbers than we do in God? Why? Because we can see them. We know when the plumber pulls in the driveway. We know when the leak is fixed. We know when the bill comes. We know when we wrote the check to pay it. We can see it. But man, when Jesus pulls into the driveway of your life, you can't see him with your physical eyes. And that's why the scripture says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what, on is, what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. The problem, the difference between Chip and Joanna and Jesus is that Chip and Joanna don't keep coming back to maintain the property. Jesus does. He says, as a matter of fact, I'm not just going to come check on you quarterly. I'm going to move and take up residence on the inside of you. And I'm going to be here minute by minute, second by second, keeping this renovation process going 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And the only reason that Jesus' renovation process gets derailed is when we find those piles that we want to hold on to. Are you a hoarder? And it's not that big of a deal. If you want to be a physical hoarder, that's fine. I go in houses all the time and have done it for years and years. It's just got tracks through the house. Because there's piles of stuff that people can't let go of. And it's been that way for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. So they got a path from the recliner to the kitchen, to the kitchen, to the bathroom, to the bathroom, to the bedroom. There's just a path through all the junk. The property is impeded by stuff. And that's a choice that we can make physically. That's not my main concern. Are you a spiritual hoarder? Because that's the problem. We pile up all these things from yesterday. Man, I hear from churches all the time that say, boy, we used to have a heyday. We used to run these numbers and these numbers. Well, why don't you do that anymore? Because we're living on yesterday's miracles. 
Folks, I don't want to ever be a pastor of a church that's had the best days behind them. I want to pastor a church that it doesn't matter what it looks like in the seats. It doesn't matter what it looks like anywhere else that our normal eyes can see. But a church has got the attitude of gratitude that knows that Jesus paid it all, that is doing a second-by-second second renovation of our hearts, and we can't get over that level of love and presence in our lives. And we refuse to live on yesterday's manna. We want fresh manna every day. Because it thanks God for his renovation process. This can be your demolition day. If you will simply settle your soul, quiet your mind, and ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, what is it in my life right now that needs to be demoed? So just as Tim plays quietly for the next few moments, I'm going to ask the prayer partners to come and Go around the building like we do. But I want you to know that these altars are wide open. When the Holy Spirit speaks, don't go rent a storage room to stick it in. Come on and let him demo it. Get it out. Get it hauled off. Don't make a pile that you can go back to you pull out what you want. Let him take it as far as the east is from the west. And you will experience a true demolition.